Hey, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to another training session here with uh, Brent Palmer. I'm the Manager of Measurement Technology for CRT Services. And this is our continuing video education uh, seminar series on liquid and uh, gas measurement, and then specifically into some devices. So please take a look at our YouTube channel, uh, CRT Services. And we have a lot of videos up there and we're continuing to increase the number we have in our library. If you have any ideas for topics, please let us know. We'll try to get them in. If you have any questions that you weren't able to ask during the course of the uh, seminar, when we're doing these live recordings, please uh, send them to us via email. And if we don't know the answers, we will definitely try to get you in touch with a industry leader that, uh, or an industry expert that may know the answers to it or will know the answers to it. We've got a uh, great Monday uh, topic, one of my favorites, which is density. And we're gonna talk about density because it's one of the most important things when it comes to, in this case, we're gonna reference liquid measurement within oil and gas, mainly because most of the transactions that we're gonna do are gonna be volumetric. They're not gonna be based upon mass. So we need to know the density of the fluid in order for us to either one, convert it if it is a uh, mass uh, product that we need to convert that into density, or if it is being corrected back to reference conditions, which most time when we're trading product or we're uh, transferring product at a custody transfer level, we're taking everything back to a, uh, a reference temperature uh, within the US. So in the US, it's 60 degrees. So when I say standard or reference, I'll be referencing 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's where we're bringing the densities back to, trying to get them back to, so then we can get the proper corrections uh, generated from the algorithms. But um, let's get started with uh, density, and if you have any questions, please uh, throw them up on the chat, or at the end, we'll have a little Q&A session, and if, uh, if I've said something wrong, and you know it's dead wrong, then please make sure you also uh, shoot me a note or uh, say something at the end and, and uh, correct me on this because uh, density to me is one of the most confusing topics that we have within our industry. And, uh, you know, it's taken me a while to, to kind of get my, my head around it a little bit and then I even uh, slip up at times. So let's go ahead and get started. So with that, we'll take a look at uh, density. And density is defined as a weight per unit of volume. So in the U.S., typically that weight is either going to be uh, grams per cubic centimeter, pounds per cubic foot, and uh, that's going to be our, our, our weights and our densities. Most times you'll see on measurement tickets it is in grams per cubic centimeter. The changes, uh, basically your density is going to change when pressure, temperature, or the composition varies within the product. And if you are using a volume flow, or so if I'm using, uh, let's say, a turbine meter or another meter that it's giving me a, uh, a volume signal out, and then I need to turn that into a mass, I'm going to need that density to turn that uh, volume into a mass. So with density, what changes density? Again, the temperature, the pressure, the composition that's within it. So we used a lot of times densitometers to determine the density of the fluid. And uh, these densitometers most times are based upon a vibrating tube type densitometer. So you'll hear of Solitron, UGC, Sarasota, Densitrack, um, Micromotion, Coriolis meters, uh, ultrasonic meters. Ultrasonic meters use a different uh, technology obviously, but for for most of the densitometers that are out there and the Coriolis meters, basically what's going on is we've got this vibrating tube and uh, the, the frequency of the vibration of the tube is measured and it's related uh, directly to the fluid density. So what happens is we induce a uh, excitation on uh, this tube and we, uh, we measure the, the, the frequency and we have the natural frequency of it and then we see the change in the frequency and then that will be a relationship to the, uh, the fluid's density. So in the case of a Coriolis, Coriolis meter, you're, where you're, uh, you're looking at the phasing of two tubes to determine what the mass and the, uh, the mass flow going through the meter is, a byproduct of that is that the, the vibration of the tube will change 
and that will be an indication of what the density of the, uh, the fluid is. Another uh, way of, we're going to look at a few different types of this, but uh, this is uh, this can be a Sarasota or a uh, Densitrac, where basically you have liquid going into a tube. It's it's uh, in a horseshoe shape, and basically the 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 fluid is going up, coming down. We have uh, the tubes vibrating, so we're inducing that on, and then we have a receiving sensor, and you can see that the frequency coming off of that is amplified. And then it's sent out to a, uh, a frequency output or a time period output that goes into a flow computer or a processor. And then that time period is turned into a density. Another example of that, you'll see that the vibrating tubes, the uh, basically the, the just showing the same thing. We have an incoming fluid, we have an outgoing fluid, we have an excitation circuit, and out of that, we're going to get a, a frequency that's produced, and that frequency is the, the vibration of the tubes, and that's going to correlate to a density by doing some, some math equations inside, and, and I'll, I'll bring those up here in a little bit. So obviously, one of the, the things that you have to have going through that tube, and you have to know that you have a good fluid going through that tube, is that you have to have a decent velocity going through there. The other thing you need to look at is, depending on how this is uh, mounted, you need to make sure that there's no entrapped uh, air or gas inside of here. So basically, we're, we're coming into a pipeline or we're attached to a pipeline and we're, we're bringing some of the flow out of the pipeline through this densitometer because obviously if the, the tube size of the, uh, the densitometers is nowhere near the size of the pipeline that's going, going through it. So, Typically, we'll use a, uh, maybe put an orifice plate in there or a differential plate to cross differential pressure between the inlet and outlet. You can use a, a valve and pinch off a valve a little bit, or there may be scoops that are going down and they're angled into the stream, the middle section of the stream, and forcing the flow, partial of the flow to come in and out, creating a, a little bit of a differential across this. So just a few ways you can get the flow through there. And these are just a few of the kind of densitometers that are out there. Uh, Micromotion, uh, Densitrack, and Sarasota. And also this is the old style of uh, Solitron, where here you can see that this is an omega-shaped uh, tube coming through for the Micromotion. It's also the same design of their, uh, their Coriolis meters. Inside the uh, Sarasota, we have that same design right here, where we have a U-shaped tube coming in also as where the, the Solitrons basically had a small bent tube and uh, the, the fluid going through there affected the, the velocity, but the, uh, it was pretty much a straight through. So the, 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 uh, the way that they do this is, the effect of it is, it's kind of a spring mass dampening system where you apply a certain amount of force or you have a certain amount of mass and then the displacement changes the, uh, it creates an oscillation frequency, it changes that oscillation frequency, and then that's a correlation to the density. And again, just showing that basically we create this time period, we're doing the same kind of effect in here where we've got a drive coil and a pickup coil, we're amplifying the, uh, the signal that's coming off of it and turning it into a time period. So when we look inside of a flow computer, we, we typically are looking at not necessarily the, the frequency that's coming in, but we're creating a time period out of that frequency. And you'll see that displayed in the flow computers that uh, just because I'm getting something coming off of a densitometer, I'm not actually getting the, um, I'm not actually getting a frequency from it, I'm actually measuring it as a time period. So there'll be a difference if I try to put a meter up to it as opposed to what the flow computer will see. So the basic density equations where um, P is the density of the fluid, is you've got some constants um, that are determined by the manufacturer on the dens dens densitometer tube that you have. So we're taking those constants and then we're applying also the time oscillation. Now we haven't corrected for the effects of temperature and pressure on the steel of the tubes, but that is a, a, another component that comes in as your uh, as your, your K constants that we're putting into either the device or the flow computer for determining the density. So these KOs, K or K0s, K1s, K2s are most times you're getting those from the manufacturer and they come in a densitometer calibration sheet. 
and that calibration sheet you you need to take a look at because there, there are a lot of dense tometers out there. Oops. We have a lot of dense tometers out there, and those dense tometers um, can be uh, older. And you need to be aware that sometimes on those calibration sheets, the constants are in metric as opposed to uh, U.S. units. So most of the flow computers, the the, the Omnis, the flow X's, and so forth, they want those de those dense tometer constants in U.S. units done in metric. So you have to do a conversion on those when uh, when you see that uh, calibration sheet. And you can always send that back into the manufacturer and they will do the conversion for you on the sheets. So, so we get this density and basically this, this uh, we start up top, we get this density frequency coming from the densitometer and we apply the densitometer coefficients. And what that is going to give us is an unfactored density. So that unfactored density then, we're going to apply a density correction factor to it. And with that density correction factor, we're going to convert that and we're going to get a flowing, uh, basically a flowing specific gravity or a flowing density that's factored, factor density. We're then in turn going to take that and we're going to apply uh, the temperature and pressure or the temperature of the, uh, the fluid. And in this case, we're going to use TP27. And with that temperature, we're going to take the density to reference conditions at 60 degrees. So you see, we get, we've got a lot going on here. So with that density at 60 degrees, we're then going to go to table 24E, and we're going to determine our CTL, which is part of our volume correction factor. And you can also see at this level, we're, we're taking the SG at 60 degrees and converting it into API at 90. The other thing that's going on is we need to determine what the equilibrium vapor pressure is so we can also come up with the CTL. So there's a compressibility factor equation that's done in 1121, 1122, and then we turn around and create this, this compressibility and bring that back out and apply it to TP15, and TP15 going through API 12.2 is gonna give us our CPL. So we kind of went a long way to come up with our two different equations and come up with our CTL and our CPL. But this is what we're using at the meter to then correct the, uh, the fluid and, a, and generate our correction for the fluid at the meter. So we have a, a density at the densitometer and provided in this case, um, I apologize, the graphic doesn't show it here, but the, uh, the, we're assuming that the meter temperature and the density temperature um, at the densitometer or the fluid temperature at both the meter and the uh, the densitometer are the same and the uh, pressures are the same. Now, if there was a difference, then our meter density would be different and our meter CTL and CPL would be different. So what we're basically doing at that point then is we're, we're coming up with this, I keep on clicking on this and I apologize, but we're coming up with our indicated volume, which is nothing more than the uh, pulses divided by the K factor of the meter. And then we're coming up with a, uh, a net volume where we're taking the indicated volume times this volume correction factor, which is the CTL and the CPL and our meter factor. And that's, that's coming up with our net. Our mass then is taking our gravity into consideration. Or if I have mass, then I'm taking the indicated volume times the mass density times uh, 350.507 to convert it back to what I need times the meter factor divided by a thousand. And then that gets us back into grams per cubic centimeters or pounds uh, to pounds per barrel in that conversion. Excuse me. And that will take our mass and get it into a volume. So really quickly into it, what does that look like inside of a flow computer? Um, we'll go into a flow computer real quick. And uh, let's go into this one. Whoops. I don't think I need to see the movie 10. There we go. And when we log into a flow computer, when, when we're uh, looking at our live information coming on, you'll see that I have an observed density, a standard density, and then my meter density. So my observed density, we have this unfactored density gravity or flowing density. In this case, this is, um, looks like this device, even though the observed density gravity type says it's in grams per cubic centimeter at 45.6, I would assume that that's going to be API gravity coming in. 
we go ahead and then apply that by the density correction factor. And that comes up with a factor density. And that factor density then can be displayed in a few different units. In this case, it uh, is displayed both as relative and specific gravity. And it's displayed as uh, API gravity factored. And then it's in grams per cubic centimeter or pounds per cubic foot. So we come up with this density. And then we're going to take it to standard conditions or at 60 degrees. So at 60 degrees, depending on the table that we have, we then go ahead and convert it over. And really it just depends on where this density is coming from. This could be coming straight from a override value that we have in here. Well, in this case, it is coming from override. So I know I've got an override value. I'm gonna change this standard density uh, override. Uh, actually, I can't change it here. Let's see, I'll apply an override of one. So with the density, we're then uh, calculating up our density at reference conditions at 60 degrees. And you can see basically we have it in grams per cubic centimeter, pounds per cubic foot, relative specific gravity. And in this case, we're, we're relative specific. We're referencing against water. Most flow computers are gonna reference against water and water at standard conditions. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is, now that I have my density at standard conditions, now I have to convert my density to meter conditions if my meter temperature and pressure are different. Once I calculate that up, what I'll come up with is, in my in-use values, I'll come up with that CTL and CPL, which are my corrections for uh, the effects of temperature and pressure on the liquid, and I combine that together and I create a CTPL, and basically then that, that gross volume is multiplied by this correction factor for the effects of temperature and pressure on the liquid. That comes through and that gives me my gross standard volume. And then my net, my net standard volume will take out the effects of sediment and water within the system. So that is basically density in a nutshell and how it affects and how it's implemented within um, flow computers. The other effect that density will have is when you're doing proving of these meters, you're gonna take into consideration the density of the fluid at the prover also. So because of the distance that you have between where the meter is and where the prover is, there are times where you may have a separate densitometer sitting at the prover, or because of that distance, distance the temperature and pressure of the meter is different than the temperature and pressure of the prover, the fluids are different temperatures and pressures there. So we know that the temperature and pressure affects the density of the fluid. So we have to calculate out what the meter's density is and then the effective temperature and pressure on the fluid at the meter, and then what the effective temperature and pressure are on the fluid at the prover, because that will, that will dictate what the prover volume is or the effect of it on the prover volume. So we'll recalculate that out too. So just some of the effects of density. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? If uh, you have any, please uh, unmute your mic. You can go ahead and ask those or put them up in the chat. All right, well, perfect. I hope that uh, everybody has a good day. Um, this video will be posted up on our YouTube SharePoint site probably within the next hour or so. So please feel free to pass it along to whoever. And uh, on CRT's website, please uh, continue to check back and see upcoming classes. Our next uh, lecture is gonna be on proving reports and how proving reports are calculated. We'll go through a mass and a volume proving report. So please check back with that, view it live, or uh, please feel free to take a look at the videos anytime you'd like. Again, if there's anything we can do for you at CRT, we uh, Appreciate you taking the time out of your day to stop in and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Have a good day.